Thanks everybody for coming tonight. Um, I really appreciate your presence. Uh, we haven't had this many bodies in this place in quite a while, and it means a lot. So I know a lot of you drove uh, quite some distances to get here, so thank you. Um, but we are here for Greg, so I'm not going to ramble. I'm going to try to rein this in. Thank you all for making the effort. But I would like to introduce Greg and just give you a little bit of background, what it was like to put together the show. So Greg and I started talking about doing an exhibit for him in the last six months. And during that process, I came to know what that really meant. And so Greg is really known for his roundup scenes. And that's what we all know and love him for. And that's how he's built his reputation. And he's built that reputation across the country. And that, I'm learning, is incredibly extensive. He and Cheryl are great partners in that. So um, I would like to read to you from his uh, invitation something holy to say. <laughs> I, oh, you know him. <laughs> Going to the same church. <laughs> right. So in this exhibition, Gregory Wilhelmy explores a world of spirituality obscured, faith smudged, and the struggle to walk again in light. And I'm going to read to you an excerpt that his daughter, Julia Wilhelmy, wrote. My father, the Catholic, gone missing in the density of decades, stands up to the ambulatory with a prayer bulletin and stubs of charcoal. As a boy, he misunderstood the sin of smuggling crayons into church. Little wax martyrs in his shirt pocket conserved the chest cavity's tender vessels. He is binding a sketchbook, saving up for a modest tin of pencils. He wants to be ready in case he has something holy to say. She wrote that in 2011. And, and so because of what I mentioned to you about um, Greg being known for his roundup scenes, uh, as, through the process of going to his studio and going to his home and seeing this work, I started to put the bits and pieces together because I would see each of these paintings separately. And so, I don't know, what, a week ago? You brought, yeah, he, he said, I think we need to hang this early, like at the end of June, you know, a week or two weeks ago. I said, oh, okay. And so he brought it, and that's when I really started to see the story. And and I would say, well, is this part of the story? And he'd say, yes. And he'd tell me a little bit more about the work. And then I'd ask him, well, is this piece, you know, because he'd show it to me. Well, would you like to put it in? Or what do you think we should do? Maybe we should put it over here. And I'd say, is it part of the story? And he said, yes. And so through that process, I got to learn part of the story, which I'm really going to hear for the first time tonight. Um, we're all here for the first time tonight. But in that one night um, that I hung it, I realized how incredibly important it is. So... Without further ado, I'm going to let Greg tell you the story. Yes, further ado. <laughs> Do you want to Google it? Uh, okay, my notes say, first thing, put on your glasses. <laughs> but since she read what I was going to read, I don't have to do that anymore. Do I have to hold this up? So you can hear yeah. Me? Okay. All right. Uh, a friend of mine and one of the Full Mountain philosophers from the area, Mick Bertel, once told me, you cannot be a prophet in your hometown. <laughs> I'm here to test that theory. Uh, <laughs> I do know that life offers you many chances to be a fool, and I haven't passed up many of them. <laughs> I sure don't want to pass up this one. <laughs> so here we go. Uh, I'm going to start with... Um, after I graduated from the University of Denver a few e you know, eons ago, I went to work at the Catholic system, register system of newspapers. And while I was there, uh, I made friends with a lot of uh, a lot of people. And one, the person that stands out was a good friend of mine named Marvin Reed. He was uh, uh, a Jesuit priest, young man. He was at the one of the glowing hopes of the Immaculate Conception Cathedral, and, uh, and a really good journalist, and he became a really good friend. And uh, this became about the drama and the, of the liberal 60s in the Catholic Church was the great hope among the young that the Catholic Church was going to lessen their, some of their firm stances, and that maybe they would, maybe birth control, maybe uh, Catholic 
I mean, women creeps may be uh, a more lenient divorce rule. Uh, and any number of changes that the young priests were looking forward to. And I think it was uh, Humanity Day, Vatican II came out, and the conservative branch of the church pretty much just put the kibosh on the whole there really was not going to be any changes, except that maybe you were not going to go to hell if you ate meat on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> so many, uh, a lot of these young priests started drifting away with their talents, and uh, Marvin, my friend, uh, got married, and I was best man at his wedding, and he... Uh, he was a journalist and a good writer for the rest of, you know, for the next 50 years and had a voice of his own. And another priest that I knew and had done some illustrations for in various Catholic publications uh, was named James Kerr. And he had a, a very successful career as a novelist. Uh, he was uh, featured in the spotlight uh, with research by the Boston Globe recently. And uh, I just, in the last couple of months, I picked up a, an Atlantic magazine. And he had an article that he had published. It's a bit strenuous, but it is in, it's an intense reading, if you have any interest in the subject. In 1973, the article that I illustrated for him were called Contemplation. And um, basically, over all these years, his viewpoint never changed. He still wrote about the same thing. But when they left the church, I left the church. But they left the church out of deep moral conviction, and I kind of left because there are a lot of rules in the Catholic Church. And I was, <laughs> I was kind of tired of trying to follow some of them. Well, yeah, all of them. <laughs> so I went, I went from there to started a little um, graphic art studio uh, called, called Pen and Brush Studio. I had a partner from a young man from New York, and uh, I'd worked up for two years, and one day I decided I cannot sell one more batch of pots and pans or one more piece of real estate or do one more ad. I'm going to be an artist. And that's where this guy came in. <laughs> and I like to refer to him in the third person because you know, I, I, he holds a dear spot in my heart, and uh, we, got, we got a lot of places, we did a lot of things. Not all of them good, in fact, probably not many of them were good. <laughs> but we got through Yugoslavia to Zagreb to Greece to Germany to Key West to Barbados to Central America. And I lugged my watercolors along with me and would set up and visit with the people and do my little paintings and trade them for whatever I could get for them. By, by 1979, uh, actually it was 78, it's not that that's important to anybody, but uh, he ended up um, in Denver, back in Denver, and uh, he was able to afford uh, an apartment. Here was the. I have this painting here. It was the, the the apartment. This was the view from the balcony. I called it Purple Rain, and it was it had that uh, was just two blocks off of Colfax, and it it really had everything a, a man needed, you know, right there. That was, that was the the and, uh, and, and I had a. The apartment that I had wasn't much, I guess, by some standards, but it was, you know, it was a step up from the $15 a week, uh, well, bedroom, I guess, I guess you could call it a boarding house that I did not before with the cooking downstairs and the cabbage and the beer and the blah, blah. <laughs> so anyway, I was feeling pretty good, and I had gotten a job at the Colorado Institute of Art part-time teaching color theory. And, uh, the money was rolling in. Not much of it, but they had a little. <laughs> and uh, a couple months into this uh, project, uh, the apartment caught fire. It was on a Friday night, and uh, there was a whole apartment complex. There were about 40 apartments in the place. And so the firemen come, and 
everybody has rushed out of the building. And uh, I pleaded with the fireman. I said, yeah, this is serious. I've got artwork in there. They're masterpieces. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta get these. I gotta get these things out of here. So. <laughs> well, I remember coming back down the hallway, and he had his flashlight, and the smoke was coming, and I'm coughing, and, and we haul out these pitiful canvases. God knows whatever happened to them, but, <laughs> but anyway, and I, and so it's I, it was a setback for a while, and then uh, I called the man that managed the department. He owned the apartment, and uh, he offered me a deal. He said. If you want to stay there as kind of a watchman and a caretaker of the place, the electricity still had a it was on in my part of the building. But said we can work this out, you can stay here rent free and uh, and I thought God is good, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I'm there. I probably smell a little charred when I go to school. But, <laughs> but you know the, the, the amenities is full facts and bar across the street was still there. One night, I'm, one night I'm, I'm in bed and I'm laying there and I'm drifting off to sleep and I'm about uh, I'm, I'm about halfway halfway asleep just going under him. Uh, and anyway I uh, I start to see I look up in the corners of the room and I I see my body floating around up there. <laughs> And I'm thinking, okay, this, this probably isn't good. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, that body and my own body take off, and we're headed, we're headed towards this light right here. We got this light, this light that came in, and, and I'm, I'm headed for it just as, just as fast as I can possibly go, and, and the closer I get to it the more I slow down. And I get almost within reach of it, and I start crawling. I'm slowed up, I guess, if I don't go anywhere. And all of a sudden, so... And I'm, I'm sitting there, and I, and I hear this. I get this. Clap, right to my forehead. <laughs> and I set up in bed. And I'm thinking, okay. And I hear a voice, and the voice says, you can't come here yet. I have things for you to do. Oh boy. And, uh, my heart stops kind of, and, uh, <laughs> and then it starts doing about 120 per. And uh, I just kind of stuck that away in my, in my soul. And uh, a few weeks later, back in the same bedroom, I was sitting there, and uh, and uh, I only tell this story because I've only told it once before to Cheryl, and, and we're not sure that I will be certifiable after that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, is that uh, I'm back in the same bed, same room, same light comes, and at the foot of my bed, a crucifix and a Christ figure and a light behind it, and we look at each other. I ain't been drinking so much since the light came. So I'm looking at it and I say, and I say, are you God? And then the cross fell over. And the cross right behind it fell over. And the one behind that fell over. And it was like dominoes then. And they just continued to fall and then there was just this bright light. Now I don't know what that means what that meant, but I parked it away in my soul, and uh, I tried for a while to do a few little paintings of it, and I, I didn't know what to do with it, so, but I had started a ser series of canvases um, with this in mind, I was trying to paint light, but just, just you can't just paint light, you can't just paint a cross, and so I, in this painting here with what I call in the light, I. I started out trying to show a transition from dark to light. Um, and I don't know how successful it is, but I felt like I was, try I was trying to get in touch with what, uh, what it was that I, that, it, that, that I had seen. 
And um, as for um, my journey for this guy, I still miss him. I liked him, you know, but his lifespan was him. getting shorter. No. <laughs> <laughs> Cheryl, Cheryl came into my life a few years later and kind of really kind of messed up, started messing that up. <laughs> but, uh, and then uh, the painting that stands right behind you, that I can't see, is that it was just both of those actually. This was, this was one of the hotels I stayed at. It, uh, that he used to stay at once in a while, aren't you often? And, uh, and, and this thing here that I call the dissipation and salvation of St. Gregory was kind of a, an attempt to uh, take a look at, um, at the fear, at the surprise, at the moment or at the time when uh, you start to try to turn something around in life. And uh, now that's a. Uh, that's kind of the heart of this show that I put together, uh, uh, this part of it. And then I, I also, then, as you probably have noticed, uh, first of all, anybody questions about my sanity or anything? Like that? <laughs> 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 yeah, my family has no doubt. But <laughs> there was, uh, I wanted to say something about uh, this other work that I have about uh, the images. This the images I have from Roundup. And, uh, I, that kind of visual journey, the journal that I have, that it's not easy for me to uh, put into words, but uh, Ben Mitchell, who was a curator at, uh, at the YAM some years back, uh, wrote a few things for me. And, uh, so it's kind of high praise. And, uh, so I don't mind reading it. <laughs> okay, so um, this is what he wrote, and I think that he touches on some things that I can't say about it because of you know, like, and he's a writer. He says, though Wilhelmy, it's me, <laughs> is an authentically traditional American realist out of the school of Bellows, Hopper, and the Wyeths, there is nonetheless a refreshingly genuine presence in his work. I like that. <laughs> Unlike many of his peers working in the West today, he doesn't settle for any sentimental, commercially driven, or transient relationship to the landscape and the places he paints. These are images of places I have watched change over the years, he says, places I have returned to often. Out of that return, he has created works that are deeply evocative, insightful, and hard won. I really like that. Working from a deeply rooted personal history out of a lifetime of both observing and participating in the life of a small rural community, Wilhelmy digs into the losses time inevitably brings to a place and discovers a rich texture at the intersection of memory and experience, a lyrical presence of place and the subtle beauty found there. So, I like that. <laughs> now, okay, um, that's the end of my chat here, and uh, does anybody have any questions? Uh, I would be glad to attempt to answer them. The painting in the upper left there. Yeah. Tell me about it. Um, I had... Uh, you would ask that. The thing about the, the doves is, about the time that my friend Marvin had died, I, I started digging out old canvases, and that I mean, I that canvas is 30 years old, and I had my studio in Denver, and I, and I had quite a few of them, and when I moved up here, I, I didn't know for sure what I was going to do with them. I got up one morning, uh, and uh, I turned on the news, and I turned off the news, and I decided I was going to paint doves. I wanted to paint something that I could just look at without causing a rumpus or having a spot or just something something peaceful, something beautiful. I did five of them. And one of them went to the Denver General Hospital in uh, Denver. Of course, Denver General Hospital. I kept, and uh, uh, I, when I kept at home, I called Passage. And uh, I'm just searching for some kind of a spiritual element in this, uh, in my work. And, and uh, there's nothing more profound than that. Thank <laughs> you.
So have you been working with this theme for a while now? And then my second question is, do the images from Roundup relate to the uh, Okay. To the story. To the story. Um, I, I start this, this, the theme about the, the, the Christ thing in the light and, and that sort of element. Uh, I had worked on it for a while back in uh, around 1990, and uh, I had done a couple of uh, Christ paintings, and uh, I kept one of them, and it was mostly all white with just texture. And uh, I liked it. People had a hard time understanding it that would see it, and I didn't, I didn't uh, want to go into any kind of a story about it. And. Uh, I gave it to a friend of mine in Denver, George, and George drank himself to death, so I figured, well, maybe the spiritual power there is not so good. <laughs> 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 no, I wish that wasn't funny, but I guess, yeah. anyway, it's about humility on some level, too. And then, uh, like, the Roundup paintings, you know, is that, um, I've done paintings and street scenes from all over the, the place, and I, there's part of me I just see as kind of like a universal image of the West and the, the, you know, the decay and yet the hope and the struggle and what's up in that. And the, the painting behind him where you can't see from there about the, the grandstand down here at the fairground, I have a lot of memories about that, but mm -hmm. I, I wanted to catch that light so it had a spiritual feeling to it, that it had something besides just being a grandstand. And so, you know, is that hokey? Is that just uh, playing on your, you know, just the, the, the drama and the feelings? Yeah, probably. But on that hand, there's a message for, I think, for people from around here, you know, that, uh, that have an emotional connection to it. And same way with the, the grade school thing here. The rest of them, but some of them are pretty, like what I call gone to seed in uh, the uh, last radio shaft and some of those are kind of just like, what we have here, and what we've done with what we have, and uh, you know, I, one thing I think that the Indian tribes used to be able to pick up their teepees and leave. Maybe just a few horse droppings, but we don't. We're a new thing, but we're only a hundred years old here, and this is what we got. You know, I mean, I don't know where it goes from here. I, I don't make predictions. I'm not. Uh, as Mick Patel said, <laughs> you can't be a prophet. Uh, so. That answer anything? All right. Can you okay. talk about this one? Yeah. Okay. That photograph of this down here, this young girl. I took that photograph in uh, Santa Rosa, Mexico, on the Pacific coast of southern Mexico. And I was up one morning. Travel shares, travel with Cheryl to the Bay of the Resort, someplace there. Got up early in the morning to see the town, and uh, so and I. Her mother was sitting next to her, about ten, you know, about five feet away, and I. So I, I asked them if I could take the photograph, and, and uh, I. Generous as I was, I gave each a buck. What does that make me? I don't know, but I believe it's something. So I, I took her photograph, and then I did. It was just kind of a haunting image. And the thing I, I should focus on was that, like her, what, her one flip flop was just kind of laying over in the dust. And, uh, so and I just have kept it around the studio, and I when we moved to Tucson, and uh, and without getting into a political thought or battle here, because that wasn't the intention. The, uh, uh, I wanted to just something with the Catholic icons, the, I, what's the word, Susan? Iconograph. Iconography. That one, okay. <laughs> that, and that, uh, just to play off that and to uh, replay, replay, replace the dollar bill with, uh, with a rosary. And, uh, mm. and I played with the title and I thought, well, what would Jesus do? I think that's about as good as I can get. I've had it hanging in our house for a number of years. I just kept it. So 
So that's kind of, the, you know, there might be a few more feelings just behind it. That, that's what I got. That's interesting. It's from 1983, but it, it yeah. seems very contemporary. Yeah, and I find that a lot of things, if you look long enough, they just take kind of bounce around the corner and come back. <laughs> well, you souls have suffered long enough. <laughs> Bless you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>